Hey everybody, we are going to talk conservation of momentum today. Before we do that, we're going to take a quick recap um, of stuff that we've been looking at recently. Uh, so momentum, inertia in motion. Another way we could look at it is how difficult is it to stop something. Uh, we calculate momentum uh, as the mass of the object times the object's velocity. So something, for example, that's not moving would have zero momentum since velocity would be zero. Um, and mass and velocity are directly proportional to momentum. So if one of those or both go up, so does momentum. And if one or both of those go down, so does momentum. Velocity and force, those are going to be important today as well. So uh, force is required to accelerate a mass, and acceleration is the change in velocity of the mass. And when two objects interact, we know from Newton's third law that they both exert an equal force or an equal magnitude force um, acting in opposite directions. So one object would exert a force on the other object, and that other object exerts an equal force right back on the first object. Again, Newton's third law. Finally, impulse. We've been talking about that as well. Impulse is the force applied to an object for a certain amount of time, and that's what's responsible for changing the momentum of the object. And impulse is actually equal to that change in momentum of the object. Now everybody's seen these at some point or another. This is a Newton's cradle and we're going to be looking at a Newton's cradle and we're going to imagine that the spheres of the Newton's cradle are an isolated system. So a system is a part of the physical universe that you're choosing to examine in that moment. An isolated system means no matter and no energy are going to go in or are going to come out of that system. So it's enclosed, it's its own isolated system within the universe. Um, and so once we put the spheres into motion on the Newton's cradle, we're going to imagine that this system is isolated. Now, in reality, the system isn't really isolated. There's gravity at play. There's air resistance. There's tension force. All these things are um, affecting the spheres in motion. But for the purposes of what we're doing, we're going to pretend that it is an isolated system. Okay, so I want you to think about this, and you might want to pause to take a look at this uh, just to make sure that you're following along when we get to the end of the slide. This system has a total momentum, so it's a sum of all of the individual momentums of the objects in this system, and it has a total before the collision, and it has a total after the collision. Now, when the spheres collide, Newton's law tells us that both objects, or both spheres, are going to exert an equal force on each other in opposite directions okay so again Newton's law tells us Newton's third law tells us that when they collide they will exert an equal force on each other in opposite directions and that is also going to happen for the same amount of time on both objects so if both objects experience the same amount of force for the same amount of time then we can say that the impulse that they are experiencing is equal as well though it will also be in opposite directions so impulse is also the change in momentum of an object and so that means that since they are both experiencing the same impulse in the opposite directions they will experience the same change in momentum in the opposite directions now what do you think that tells you about the total momentum of the system before and after the collision Think about that, and we're going to examine that. Now, for each trial that we look at with the Newton's cradle, we're going to be looking at the momentum of the system immediately before and immediately after the collision. How will the total momentum of the system compare before and after? Let's take a look at some of those trials. Each sphere on the cradle has the same mass, so we can call each sphere a mass or mass unit. For this scenario, one mass is in motion just before the collision, and four masses are not. So if we add one mass times its velocity, plus four masses with zero velocity, the total or net momentum of the system of spheres is one mass times velocity to the right. Remember that momentum is a vector, so we do need to include the direction. Directly after the collision, we can see that the mass that was originally moving has stopped, but another mass is now moving. While the individual momentums of those spheres has changed, the net momentum of the system is still the same. The momentum was just transferred from one mass to another, but again, the net momentum of the system has remained unchanged. In this scenario, we are going to have two spheres in motion before the collision. 
This one is a little different in that the two spheres will be moving in opposite directions, and since momentum is a vector and includes direction, the momentums of those two masses will cancel each other out. The other three spheres are not in motion, so they have no momentum. The initial net momentum of the system is zero. Now does that mean that there will be no motion after the collision? Nope. We still have two spheres in motion after the collision, but notice again they are moving in opposite directions. These cancel out as well, and combined with the other three spheres with zero velocity, zero momentum, the total momentum of the system remains at zero. The final scenario we are going to look at will have four masses in motion before the collision. The net momentum of the system before the collision is four masses times their velocity. And I'm sure you have figured out by now, after the collision, the net momentum has remained the same. Though the individual momentums of two of the spheres has changed, the overall net momentum of the system has remained unchanged. Now that brings us to a really important concept in physics, and that is the law of conservation of momentum. And what that says is, is that in an isolated system where no external or outside forces can interfere with that system, uh, so no energy in, no energy out, uh, total momentum should remain constant. It should remain unchanged. It's conserved, and that means total momentum will not go up. It won't go down. Now, individual momentums or momenta, however you like to say it, will change. Uh, you know, if two objects within the system interact, um, they're going to transfer momentums. Um, but the total momentum, if you sum all of the individual momenta in the system together, you should get the same number before and after any interactions assuming the system is a closed system. So another way to put that is momentum cannot be created nor destroyed. Uh, and in other words, momentum uh, has to be transferred to or from something. It can't just appear or disappear. So momentum isn't being created. It's not just appearing out of nowhere. It's not being destroyed. Um, that means it's not just going away somewhere. It has to be accounted for and it's being transferred between objects when they interact. Let's go back to the colliding spheres example that we saw in the beginning. We figured out that during the collision, both spheres apply an equal force on each other, but in opposite directions. That's Newton's third law. Since both spheres experience these forces over the same amount of time, they are then experiencing equal amounts of impulse in opposite directions. And since the impulse applied to a sphere is equal to the change in momentum of the sphere, both spheres then experience an equal change to their momentums, again in the opposite direction. So if we want to find the total momentum of the system after the collision, we have to apply those changes to the total momentum of the system before the collision. When we do that, those two changes end up canceling each other out, and the result is that the total momentum of the system before and after the collision is equal. But how is that possible? Wasn't momentum gained and lost somewhere? Well, yes, the momentum lost by one object, say the blue ball, is gained by the other object, the red ball, and vice versa. So the momentum lost by the red ball is in turn gained by the blue ball, but overall no momentum is added or removed from the system. The total momentum of the system is still the same. Now there is a formula that we can use for the conservation of momentum. We know that calculating individual momenta is simply multiplying the object's mass times its velocity. And to get the total momentum of a system, we need to add up the momenta of all of the objects in that system. So to start with, we're going to say that P total equals P total. The momentum of the system before the collision equals the momentum of the system after the collision. We know that the momentum of the system is made up uh, by the sum of the momentums in, of the objects in the system. So the momentum of object 1 plus the momentum of object 2 gives us our total momentum. We know that the momentum of each object can be calculated as the mass of the object times the object's velocity, and so we're going to substitute that in from here. And so we can show the momentum of object 1 as the mass of object 1 times the velocity of object 1, and we add that to the momentum of object 2, which is shown here as the mass of object 2 times the velocity of object 2. And we do that on both sides of the equality, um, making sure that we plug in the correct values of mass and velocity on both sides. Now some of these values are going to change after the collision, so you need to be really careful that you're filling in the correct information. But this formula here, mass of object 1 times velocity of object 1 plus mass of object 2 times velocity of object 2 is equal to, well, the same formulas, 
um, we can use this for the law of conservation of momentum because this is basically saying that both sides of this equation should be equal. In other words, saying that momentum was conserved. All right, we're going to look at two practice problems where we can use the formula for law of conservation of momentum. Uh, so keep in mind that you're going to want to pause the video after we read through the question so that you can have a chance to try it out before hearing the explanation. Then you can hit play and get the explanation and the answer for the question. Also, I may have to remove the video of my face talking because uh, there may not be room with all the numbers. So if I disappear for a moment, it's because I was trying to fit some extra numbers. All right, the first problem here, the orange ball has a mass of 2 kilograms and the white ball has a mass of 3 kilograms. Before the collision, the orange ball has a velocity of 10 meters per second to the right, and the white ball's velocity is 15 meters per second to the left. After the collision, the orange ball has a velocity of 18 meters per second to the left. What is the new velocity of the white ball after the collision? Now, I'm going to give you a hint. Uh, law of conservation of momentum's formula is definitely going to come into play here. And another hint, don't forget direction, positive and negatives. All right, give it a shot. All right, let's take a look at the answer to this. So we are going to say that the orange ball is object one and the white ball is object two. So using my formula for conservation of momentum, I'm going to plug in the values that I know. I know the mass and velocities for both objects before the collision. I was told that. So two kilograms uh, for the orange ball and its velocity was 10 meters per second to the right, so it's positive 10. And the white ball is 3 kilograms, and it is moving at 15 meters per second to the left, so negative 15 meters per second. I can't stress enough how important it is to use your positive and negatives for direction in these cases. After the collision, we're told that the uh, orange ball has a velocity of 18 meters per second to the left. Um, and so that's negative 18 meters per second. Now the masses of the uh, balls did not change, and so we're gonna plug those in just like we did before the collision. So two kilograms for the orange ball and three kilograms for the white ball. Now at this point, we can simplify this formula down to try to get the unknown velocity by itself. Um, and so I'm going to simplify these formulas here to get the individual momenta. And so we can see we have 20 uh, minus 30 is equal to negative 36 plus 3 times the velocity. And I can move the 36 over to the left side to get the velocity by itself. And so I'm going to simplify this down even further with some algebra. And we find that our final velocity for the uh, white ball is going to be 8.67 meters per second okay and that is positive so very important if you look at the image um, you know the white ball started off by moving left they collided and now it's moving to the right so you should expect a positive number for that answer okay so again that velocity is positive it's to the right and that makes sense after the collision all right, this next practice problem involves one of the objects being at rest so it's not moving initially uh, so a 3,000 kilogram truck is driving to the right at 10 meters per second. The truck hits a 1,000 kilogram parked car with a velocity of 0 meters per second. It's parked. After the collision, the car's velocity is 15 meters per second to the right. What is the velocity of the truck after the collision? All right, so again, pause the video, give it a shot, see if you can figure it out, and we'll go over the explanation when you hit play. All right, so let's go ahead and look at the answer to this. Um, so the first thing you might want to do is draw a picture showing the two objects before and after the collision, and this helps you to visualize. Uh, and special thanks to Mr. McGarry for putting the slide together, and that is a tip that he likes to give his students as well, so I am using it for you guys. Um, so if we draw a picture, we can see that we have the truck. Um, just before the collision, the truck hits the car. Um, now we want to know what, that miss, uh, what the velocity of the truck is after that collision. Um, so the next thing we want to do is decide which object is going to be object one and which one will be object two. So let's call the truck object one and the car is going to be object two for this example. Now you're ready to set up the equation based on what you already know and now you can solve for that unknown velocity of the truck. So before the collision, 
We're going to plug in the values for all of the vehicles. So we have the 3,000 kilogram truck moving at 10 meters per second, and we have the 1,000 kilogram car that is parked. It's not moving. And we're going to fill in what we know about after the collision. Um, so, you know, the truck and the car didn't change their masses, so we can put those in again. Um, but the velocity of the car obviously changed from parking to not. It's now moving down the street. Um, and we want to know what the velocity of the truck is now after it ran to the car. So again, just like last time, we're going to simplify this formula down by solving for the individual momenta. And we're going to try to isolate that unknown velocity so we can solve for it. So when we do that, we see that we get a velocity of the truck as 5 meters per second. So after the collision, the truck now has a velocity of 5 meters per second. And again, that is a positive 5, so that means it is to the right. Okay, again, very important. Um, so, uh, and we can see that it started with a velocity of 10 meters per second, and now it's 5 meters per second. And that makes sense. It slowed down after running into something. Um, so another way to kind of confirm that we're on the right track with our answer. All right, I hope this helped. Uh, if you need additional help, please absolutely go get it. Uh, and thank you for watching.